Most software projects out there will be under a single license. Maybe it'll be GPO v2. Maybe it'll be an MIT license. Maybe it'll be a three clause BSD license. And while these licenses by themselves can be fairly difficult to understand, it's not that complicated of a task. But you don't just have to use a single license. Projects actually can be licensed under two, three, four, or even more than that. And this is perfectly okay. But this practice has sort of been described as sort of having your cake and eating it too, because it gives a lot of power to the owners of a project that would not have been there by just having a single license. Throughout the rest of the video, I'm going to refer to two licenses, but everything that applies to two also applies to three or any more after that as well. So first we have to explain what we mean by being licensed under two licenses. So there's two main ways this can be done. The first way is by taking different sections of the code base and then having those under different licenses. Let's say we have a stock management system and the user interface is licensed under MIT and then the back end is licensed under GPL v2. While both of these are likely going to be released together as one complete product, you can effectively look at this as two separate projects. So let's say you have the front end in one repo and then the back end in another repo. And this is actually how a lot of projects manage this because it can get kind of confusing having two licenses operating at the exact same time. That method is really easy to understand and you're probably using it for something right now. But that's not the reason why I made this video. The reason why I made this is for the second type. And that is where you take the entire project Let's say we have that stock management system again, and then you license all of it under two or more licenses at the exact same time. So that would be the stock management system being both a GPL v2 project and also an MIT project. And that's typically how this structure is going to be used. You have some sort of GPL license on one side, maybe GPL v2, AGPL, LGPL, whatever sort of suits your use case. And then on the other side, you have some sort of license like MIT or BSD2 clause or 3 clause, which allows for proprietary usage. For reasons that should be obvious, these licenses are completely incompatible. So how in the world do you have a project licensed under both at the exact same time? Well, there's two sides of the coin here. So the project is licensed under both of them, but when you distribute that project, you're not actually distributing it under the terms of both licenses at the exact same time. What this gives you the power to do is choose which license to distribute it under. So for one person, you can give them the GPL v2 version, and for another person, you can give them the MIT version. And this isn't two forks of the project, this is the exact same code base, licensed under two licenses for two different people. And there's nothing stopping you just letting the users decide which license they want to use. Maybe I like GPL v2 more than MIT. Maybe this person likes MIT more. You could just let them pick and choose which they want. But generally, that's not the reason why you dual license a project. The biggest reason for doing so is commercialization. I guarantee you've seen this model before where there is a version that is free for personal and educational use and the source code is even available under, say, some sort of GPL license, maybe GPL v3. But then there is another version, and that version has a fee attached to it for commercial and proprietary use, and you don't actually get access to the source code. Sometimes it also come with extra features to entice the regular users to pay for it as well, but not all of the time. This is the way you typically see a dual license project. One great example of this is Bitwarden, where there is the GPL version available completely for free that regular people can go and use, but if you want to use it in a company, you have to go and pay for it. And this paid version has a bunch of extra features. That version is a proprietary version. Or another really great example of this is with MySQL, which has a free version, which is GPL'd. Now, you might also know that there's a lot of applications out there that actually have MySQL embedded inside of the application, and those applications are proprietary. So, why hasn't MySQL lawyers just gone and tried to sue them? The reason why is because they've actually gone and purchased a commercial license where that code base is going to be licensed under something different. You should be starting to see why companies do this. You get the benefits of free software by allowing the community to develop your software with you, but not allowing your competitors to go and take that source code and then embed it inside of their proprietary application 
at least without paying you. And you also get people sort of hooked on the free version. And if they want to use it in a commercial context, then they have to come back and pay you anyway. This is why it's described as having your cake and eating it too. You get all of these benefits of free software, but you don't have to commit to your software actually being free software like everyone else making free software does. It gives you the ability to have this thing that looks like free software, but still benefit from it being proprietary. Now, there's a slight problem with the way this functions. So in-house development is incredibly easy because normally when you have employees, you get them to sign away all rights to their code as part of their employee contract. You can go and relicense that code as you want and they can't say anything about it but it becomes a little bit more challenging if you start accepting external contributions because let's say someone submits code under GPL v2. You can't then just go and relicense that under MIT to make it work in your dual licensing system. So there are two ways this can be handled. The first way is to maintain two distinct versions of the code base. This is sort of like the option we had at the start where the two sections of the code base were licensed differently. So when you do it like this, typically what's going to happen is the GPL version or whatever version is the main version that's not going to be proprietary is going to become the better version. So there's sort of less of a reason for anyone to actually want to use the commercial version. This can be alleviated by having in-house developers going and re-implementing those features, but that is a massive time and money commitment that a lot of projects probably aren't willing to make. Now, the second way you can deal with this is effectively treat your external contributors as if they are employees. The way you do this is with a contributor license agreement. So you get none of the benefits of being an employee, for example, holiday or pay at all, but you still have to sign away your rights as if you are working for the company. Now, different CLAs are different levels of extreme in this. In the case of Audacity, they have a CLA that says, we can use your contributions in any way. That's very dangerous. That allows them to do literally anything they want. And a CLA is typically how it's going to be handled. This is exactly what Bitwarden does to make sure they have the GPL version as well as the proprietary version. So if you see a CLA, make sure you run away. Simple as that, because if there is a CLA there, there is a high chance the project is either going to go proprietary or it is going to be dual licensed in a way that a version of it can be made proprietary. Now you might be thinking, doesn't both the CLA and the dual licensing violate the spirit of free software? Yes, that, that's all I can say about that. The answer is yes. Both of these combined together effectively introduce a bug into GPO that allows you to just completely forget that it exists. Whether you think this is a good thing or not basically depends on where you stand on the FOSS question. If your goal is utopian free software, you should be running away at the first sight of a CLA and dual licensing because it provides a very simple way out for companies and they are going to exploit it. If your goal, however, is more open source software, this basically incentivizes companies to actually make their software open source because it provides them a very easy way to commercialize software that they otherwise would not have been able to do. I am not going to tell you what to think. I'm not going to tell you that free software or open source software is better. I feel like everyone watching this channel is old enough to work out that question for themselves. I hope that what I've said throughout this video gives you a better understanding of how dual licensing actually works and let you decide where you actually stand on this question. One thing I do want to say is not every project uses dual licensing and a CLA to do something malicious. Some projects out there do it to evade licensing restrictions that exist in ways they want to distribute the software. For example, if you want to go and distribute an app on the iOS store, the iOS store is incompatible with GPL, so you can make use of this model to evade this restriction. It's just that there are better ways to evade the restriction that don't give the owners of the project that much power. But I will leave it up to you guys to decide. I hope that gives you a better idea about dual licensing, and if I got anything wrong, do let me know in the comment section down below, or if there's anything you're confused about down below. 
That'll be everything for me, and before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Joachim Donald, Logan Michael, Andrew Mitchell, Nathan, David Carl, Will, Brennan, Chica Bento, Jamie Joseph, Josh, Michael, Peter D, Stephen Tees, through Tony Tushar, and all my Tudor supporters. If you'd like to go on support work, the link's down below to my Patreon, subscribe, star, leave a that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over Tea, available basically anywhere. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robertson Plays, where I live stream twice a week, and I upload shorts about five or so times a week, and this channel is available over on Odyssey. That's it for me, and I'm out.